I would now like to introduce our chief guest for the day, Mr. Harsh Mariwala. Mr. Mariwala leads Mariko Limited as its chairman. He is also chairman and managing director of Kaya Limited. Mr. Mariwala's passion for innovation enthused him to establish the Mariko Innovation Foundation in 2003, which works towards nurturing innovations in India. In 2012, Mr. Mariwala started Ascent Foundation, a peer learning entrepreneurial platform. Sharp Ventures is the family office of the Harsh Mariwala family. He also founded the Mariwala Health Initiative in 2015 with the philanthropic aim of giving back to the society. Mr. Mariwala was recently awarded the All India Management Association Lifetime Achievement Award 2021. He was also bestowed the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award 2020 for India which is the world's most prestigious business, business award for entrepreneurs. So ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seat belts and let's get ready to witness the fireside chat of the day. May I invite Mr. Harsh Mariwala and Dr. Tulsi Jaikumar on the stage. May I request Dean Sir to come up to the stage to felicitate, felicitate Mr. Harsh, please. So, Mr. Mariwala, warm welcome to SPJMR. And the person that we are seeing today, the person who is the founder of Marico, is not the person as many people knew him earlier, which by his own uh, admission in the book, Harsh Realities, he talks about himself as being a diffident and an introverted person. Right? So, Mr. Mari Mariwala, my first question to you is, uh, what about this, what, what really uh, caused this kind of a transformation from a diffident, introverted person to this sharp businessman who has built one of the most well-known and respected Indian multinationals? And what was the role of the family uh, in this transformation? So, thank you, Tulsi. Thank you, Varun, for having me over here on this momentous occasion of 25 years. And I've heard a lot about this program. And I think you must be the most highly rated program in India, at least. Yes, sir. As I far think as family. so. <laughs> so congratulations to all of you. <laughs> Having said that, uh, you know, I've been associated with SPGen for many, many years. I, I must have come here first time, maybe about 15 years. I must have spoken here to MBA students at least three, four times. I sure. was very close to Professor Shrikant. Yes, I'm aware uh, of that. I worked with him. He was at some, some time, a few times, I worked him as a consultant. And I really had a very high respect and regard for him because he had a different mind, you know, <laughs> right. and a very innovative approach to thinking. Absolutely. So, uh, so so happy to be back here, and back here in the ML Shrikant board's room, which is which is very heartening. Having said that, uh, <laughs> transformation, you know, I was quiet. You're right. I was not that bright in studies like many of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was not bad, but I didn't never fail, things like that, but I was not at the top. Sure. So, and nor was I so good in sports, so some degree of quietness, you know, not that confidence, but I think sometimes being an introvert helps, you know, because you start thinking deep, 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 you know. And I was, but I, I must say that I have been blessed with a business opportunistic mindset sure. and I have always wanted to to be in business. I have never thought that I will work for somebody else. Somebody. So that was something very clear. And in my school days, college days also I used to do small, small businesses and I earned, at that time I earned a lot of money in, in those days uh, by doing this small kind of businesses. So I. 
I was passionate about it and the kind of business I went into, I think it helped also because if I had gone into a business which required me to go to Delhi for a license, I would have been a disaster because, uh, you know, working with bureaucrats or even if I was in a B2B business where I had to sell products to, to a buyer of a big company and more than just selling, entertain, you know, dinner, that was not me. So luckily I was able to find my calling into consumer products where I had to deal with people at a very basic level in small towns, distributors and I, I mean I was very comfortable doing that. Pun unintended, that was not your cup of oil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it just so happened that I got the right calling in terms of, I mean I made some right choices also because we also had businesses in the family which, which required one to travel to Delhi. We had B2B business, we had an export business, but I for one chose to to convert the unbranded edible oil business into branded. And I think that's where I, I strongly feel that every person has some God-given gifts. Every person in this world has some God-given gifts and many of us don't know what our gifts are. And we need to identify them. So, and we need to leverage them and not really, of, of course, we all have our weaknesses. Every person has a weaknesses. But I, for one, believe that, you know, if you are able to leverage your strengths in, in molding your whatever you're doing in life, uh, then your chances of success are higher. And luckily, it, I was able to leverage my strengths in terms of working with consumers, retail. Uh, and I think that as I grew, I started getting more and more confidence. And if you asked me in the beginning, I I could never have spoken to an, any audience, even 15, 20 people, you know, I would start sweating. But, so, uh, all our FMB students develops, take heart you know. from what sir is saying. You need to grow. Yeah, and you, you grow then, you know, start taking small steps and then you start getting confidence and then, of course, if I, I still feel a little odd if I have to speak on a subject which I am not good at. And I normally, for any meeting or any speech, I like to prepare myself, not that I go on referring it to, but just some bullet points. I don't like written speeches, but prepare myself so that I know what I am going to speak on. And many a times, you know, do some some research in the background and then be ready, you know. So, um, your book is titled Harsh Reality, Sir, and uh, Simmer from our alum was saying that what a courageous title that is. So would like to know what are the harsh realities of a family business. There are people who are just coming into the business. A family business is full of challenges, but there are also opportunities. So how did you make that, um, uh, that, that entrepreneurial foray yeah. in a manner that there was a change? And so what were the before harsh I answer your question, I, you're right, you know, the name of the book is Harsh Realities and it was something which I wanted unique in terms of a title. Yeah. And I had thrown a challenge to some of the entrepreneurs we work with in Ascent and we have a, at least one entrepreneur who is a part of Ascent. Uh, and then, uh, you know, they came with many, many suggestions and I, I really loved this title because it was actually a pun on my name. And it also covered the book and I think it has got a phenomenal kind of a, a response in terms of the name of the book. And not only that, the, the cover of the book also, if you see the cover That's of the book, it portrays me. So normally when you come out with a book, you go to the publisher and normally they have, a, they have their own design department. They come with 10, 20 options. The, the author's picture is there on, on the front of the, the front cover. I didn't want that to happen. So I identified one lady who only specialized in book covers. And she read the whole manuscript. She had two, three sessions, she just understood me in detail what I was and what the book about was about. So she came up with a book, in my opinion, which is innovative, the cover, which is transparent, which is me, which is very open. So the name of the book, the cover, and of course the book itself <laughs> has had a good response and I'm happy with the way the whole thing has turned up. And now to answer your question in terms of what the harsh realities in a family managed business. I may just refer to some of, um, I think the first thing is the role of the family and what is the kind of business you are in and what role can family play. Now there are certain types of businesses which 
require a very high level of attention from families. Businesses, for example, which require decisions which may have a big impact on, on the profitability. For example, if you are in a trading business or if you are in a speculative business, that individual judgment is very, very important. And only a family member would be given that kind of a freedom. Of course, in, the, in some professional organization that ultimately passes on. But I think a lot depends on what is the kind of business it is. And on the other side, who are the family members who are managing the business. The unfortunately, many family members, the next generation when they come in, they think that because they are a part of the family, they are entitled to play a role in the business. And that's not right. You, of course, you have a certain right to ask for a role. But you have to look at what is what you're entitled to and what is your responsibility and what is your accountability. In many families, there is no accountability for their family members, you know, especially in joint families, that people think it's my family, it's nobody is holding you accountable and everything is managed by the whole family. So there is very little segregation of individual responsibilities in a family managed business because everybody is doing everything. And uh, and then there is a distance between the two generations, the el the founder generation, the next generation in terms of the way of doing business. So it's very, very dynamic, the whole situation, the business on one side, what kind of transformation the business is undergoing, uh, what, how does the business needs to change. And on the other side, the family and which are the best family members to manage the business. But as I was saying earlier, you know, I think the family has to decide what is important. The business is more important than the family. And many a times some families say that, okay, family is more important and it's okay if the business goes down. But I was very clear as far as I was concerned, the business was more important because if the business is attended to from the right angle by the family, then the family itself will benefit because the business does well. Uh, but if the family takes priority over the business, the business may suffer. And the whole family suffers, at least financially. And also in terms of feeling good because success is just not financial. It is much more than financial. It is the way you recognize, it is the challenge, it is the inner satisfaction of creating something as, as Varun was saying. It is just not shareholders. I mean, most family or most owners don't run a business to make money. Beyond a point, money is not important. But what impact are you creating uh, in the society? How are you... I mean, how are you positively impacting all the stakeholders, whether it's your customers, your employees, your associates, and of course the owners. And I think that's where uh, this whole thing at looking at all the stakeholders is very important than just looking at the owners as far as family. So I think these are the kind of things which the family has to realize. Um, I strongly feel that governance is very important, not only for a family business, not only for a startup. Uh, many family businesses think that I can start taking shortcuts because the business is small or the family is deeply involved. But at some stage it will haunt you and I for one believe that governance is important from the day you start business. Because the moment you start taking shortcuts, you're creating a culture of creating shortcuts down the line. And when you grow, that culture will continue. People down the line will say, okay, why don't we bribe somebody or why don't we do something which will give us speed. But there is a certain risk attached to it. And when you get caught, it puts you back by a huge... And people don't realize that how... You know, it just puts you back by many, many years. So I think the families have to look at governance from a very, very... It's a very important part of any business success. And then finally, the, the family charter, depending again on the size of the family, you know, what is the role of the elders, what is the role of youngsters, when will a person enter the business, when will a person exit the business, um, things like lifestyle, uh, uh, image building, conflict resolution. I think these are very, very important things which the family has to sit down and decide. A lot depends on the trust within the family members, but I'm talking of a situation where the family is large. If the family is very small, two, three people, and they're able to exist normally, then you don't require all that to be put in writing. But we have seen that in 
business is where there are two brothers, the fights are huge, there are families where twenty people, family members, then they are able to coexist peacefully. So there is no right answer. Sure. In fact, I was just reading yesterday uh, about the TVS group, which has this very innovative uh, uh, point in their constitution, which they created, that after 111 years, the family will actually break up. So it's a very different kind of thinking. But anyway, I move on to the third uh, question, sir, for the morning. You know, we are reading about Twitter and we are reading about Elon Musk. You faced your own uh, hostile takeover bid somewhere in the early 2000s when uh, the Hindustan Lever chairman, KK Dadi Seth, proposed to buy you out with your brand parachute. And he promised you to give you enough resources to take care of yourself and all the future generations. So here was an MNC with a market capitalization of 50 times of yours. So what was the kind of poison pill that you used against in the San Leo at that time? And uh, what is it that the young entrepreneurs and the young family business science can learn from you uh, regarding building com companies uh, which face those kind of takeovers? So it was a very difficult moment for me and not only for me but uh, uh, for the whole company because uh, as you were rightly put it there was this assault and they went public in the analyst meets and you know in the in the marketplace distributors uh, saying that we will we have entered this field and you know uh, Mariko will be history that's history, what yeah. I think he said <laughs> yeah so I mean attack from various fronts ultimately culminating in a phone call to me saying that I wanted to sell out and all your future generations will be taken care of financially. But as I mentioned earlier, I am not driven by money. Uh, so I think that was something which didn't excite me at all. Uh, that I will have enough money and I can enjoy because I don't think money, even if today also, you know, I don't think my lifestyle has changed dramatically. Uh, and that money gives me that I can go on enjoying. I have to be mentally occupied in whatever <laughs> I do, whether it's business or giving activities or whatever else, you know. So I think that was the background. But having said that, I think each business has to evaluate to what extent are they vulnerable. Suppose if any of you get a threat from somebody else wanting to acquire, I don't think one should be dogged about it. One should not be emotional, I don't want to sell out. But I think there has to be rational decision. So me, it was a combination of rational and emotional that built the brand. So I was emotional about this business. Of course, I wanted to retain. But I also put a rational hat to what I was doing. And that rational thinking was that in this category, we we are the largest. We, because it is our most important product, which is forming about 60% of our turnover, it gets a lot of top management attention. We have a very strong brand, uh, and if it went into a hand like levers, it will get attended to by somebody two or three levers lower from the chairman. In this case, I would myself be attending. So there will be a mismatch between the kind of attention which we would give compared to what they would be able to do. They would give it to a product manager or, or a group product manager or thing like that. So our ability to react would be higher. And we also said that uh, we know this business inside out. And we have built a strong brand. Uh, we are weak in two, three areas, so we should try and improve if we want to take them on. So one was distribution, where uh, we were not that strong in rural distribution. So we started a, a rural distribution expansion program through what we called super distributors at that time in order to cope up with their strengths in rural distribution. On the product itself, uh, we did, took some steps to improve our quality of product, so they could not have beaten us on the product. On the brand itself, we, uh, I think we added a lot of emotions to the brand. And we used the purity of coconuts and the auspicious occasion when coconuts are used in India when you get married or when you enter a house and we leverage that in our advertising campaign. So we built a very strong emotional bonding uh, when, when we had to take them on. And finally, we had to motivate our field force. So we just went overboard in 
ensuring that our field force is motivated, not only our field force, but our distributors' field force also. And we said that we'll take them on. Uh, it was four or five years, and also at that time we had just gone public, so we, we said that let's take our shareholders in confidence, and we went to them and said that this is something which we're going to do, so don't expect growth in profits for a year or two. So the transparency also helped, and we just said that we are taking them on, and we will sacrifice our profits, but we will not sacrifice our market share. So four or five years we 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 took them on. Uh, our profits got impacted for one or two years. Uh, our market shares didn't fall at all. They grew their market share from substantially from other weaker players, but it didn't impact us at all. Actually, it helped us a lot in terms of distribution, the brand, the overall morale. So at some stage after four or five years, they started losing interest in this category because at that time, Hindustan Levers started becoming more unileverized based on their corporate office directors based in London and wherever in Europe. And uh, they started neglecting this business and their market share started falling. And that is the time uh, I was able to convince the chairman of Levers to put the brand on sale because it is falling, in, which they did. I thought it will come automatically to me, unfortunately. <laughs> they, didn't. they said we'll have an open auction, which and all the Indian FMCG players participated, including us, Dabur, Godrej, Imami. Uh, but we were very clear that we have to acquire this business because otherwise we would have another strong competitor we would be able to consolidate our market share if we acquired them. So we went overboard in acquiring this brand. So we were much, much higher than many other, any other Indian player in terms of our bid. But looking back, it has been fully worth it because the benefit which you got is huge. So the from selling out to history. them, yeah, we acquired them. And that had a huge kind of positivity in, in the organization. It's an amazing story, guys. It's just an amazing story of acquiring Nihar which uh, started off with a 7% market share, grew to 21% market share, and then HLL, uh, as it was called then, sold off to Marico, whom they wanted to turn into history. But so, just to add, I think mean, one or two things which I forgot, you know, because you've written a book on Uday, so I know Uday, Uday Kotak very well. Yes. So I spoke to Uday, what to yes, do, and Uday said, why don't you meet uh, Karsan Bhai Patel, you know, Nirma, because they had taken so I went specially in Ahmedabad to meet Karsan Bhai and, you know, I said, this is the situation, what should I be doing? And he gave me all the confidence saying that, you know, don't get scared of them. And I think that That's also amazing. played some role. Yeah. So it's amazing because, you know, when we were interviewing Mr. Kotak also, when he w ran into problems with his IPO, uh, he reached out to Mr. Deepak Parikh. So I think it's also very important for you as family businesses to realize that you're not competing with each other. The networks that we talk about are really, really valuable, and you use them uh, much beyond just going out and partying, you know, as, as I can see in the and case of all of Just one more these. example. As I yeah. <laughs> see, I, I work a lot with Professor Amcharan, who is also the yes, co-author of the absolutely. book. So I said, what do I do? I say, no, you, you be firm. You, you have a right to win. This is your resource generating engine. Right. And I think we've been, so, and you have to protect that resource generating engine. Absolutely. Lovely, sir. So, um, we keep uh, seeing this word innovation being banded around. Everybody but everybody under the sun says, I'm innovating. So what is innovation to you, Mr. Mariwala? And how important is innovation for family businesses and entrepreneurs both? So, you know, I realized the importance of innovation maybe 20 years back. Whenever we have done which, anything which is innovative, and if you look at our history, Whenever we've done something innovative, sometimes innovation has succeeded, but the scale has not come because the innovation opportunity was low. But if I look back at all our brand, there is something differentiated we've done which has made us succeed in the marketplace. And that competition has increased over a period of time. So if you have to succeed in the marketplace, you have to innovate not just when you launch a product, but on a perpetual basis, because it is a matter of time, others will start copying you. So in a brand like Parachute, we innovated through the packaging route, multiple innovations in packaging. In a brand like Safola, we pioneered the health part in edible oil, and you know, now it's healthy edible oils and now healthy foods also, you know. 
and with whichever brand you take, whether it's a Revive Starch or Medicare, a brand which we acquired from Procter & Gamble was only available in shampoos, which is anti-lice shampoos. And we realized that we, if we launch the same product in an oil format, it will, our sales will increase. So we launched Medicare Oil and the sales doubled. Uh, so I think my belief in innovation is, is very, very high. Uh, and that's why we started the Marico Innovation Foundation because I think India has to, if you, India has to succeed, innovation has to play a very, very important role. And a me too kind of business will not give you a right to win. You can't succeed in a business just because you have a lower cost structure, somebody else will copy you and they will hit out at you. So, but it's difficult to create a culture of innovation and I thought that's what we we did in, in Marico that how do you create a culture of innovation where everybody in the organization is thinking of innovation and it is just not driven by an individual in R&D department or marketing but every person at even at the shop floor level uh, is thinking of what can I do differently and it need not be connected to the end product it could be a process you may be doing uh, it could be manufacturing led but I think innovation has to be in the DNA of the organization. For that to happen, you need to have very good talent. You need to have diversity because diversity brings in different thought processes. You need to have a culture which is very open because innovation doesn't happen in just one mind, but it happens through dialogues with others. Uh, there has to be a degree of transparency. Uh, and the most important thing is if somebody has some idea and it they should not have that fear of failure because if the organization is punishing failures of somebody doing something differently, then people will stop innovating. And innovation is, a failure is a part and parcel of innovation. When multiple times we have failed, it's very difficult to be 100% perfect when you go in the marketplace and market research has its own set of limitations. There is no shortcut to going to the marketplace, but many a times you may think that something will succeed, but it has not succeeded because ultimately you have to test it out with the consumer. You can de-risk it by doing it on a, on a smaller scale. But I think the key thing for the organization and the leadership is to ensure that people experiment, they take risks and remove that fear of failure. Very nicely put, sir, and I think that's one key difference between the people who come here to study an MBA versus all of you who are coming here to do your family business or your entrepreneurship. You know, that's a program, those are programs which are, uh, which are designed to succeed, right? And here you have to accept failure. So I think that's very, very critical. And uh, I think you also touched upon the, the point about talent, which I think is so critical. How do you as a family business retain talent, attract talent, nurture? And Marico was one of the uh, very well-known companies. It's a story of how the founder stepped down, Mr. Mariwala stepped down in 2014 to let a professional CEO run the company. So you've already spoken about that, sir. Any you know, last piece of advice on you know, how do you nurture talent? So I think we must realize that there is a war for talent and the top management has to play a very, very important role in creating the right image for you to attract talent, you know. You can't say that, give it to HR function, give it to some headhunter, it will not work. You have to be the ambassadors for your organization in creating the right image. You need to identify what is the, your employee value proposition in a market where there is a war for talent. And you need to be clear where is your target group, where do you want to attract talent from. Uh, unfortunately, many Indian promoters, family managed organization, they look at at hiring from a contract, it's like purchasing, I want to purchase, so I'm in a superior position. You have to market yourself, you're marketing yourself and not expecting every person. So you have to market yourself and try and get the best quality talent through headhunters, through identification of individuals based on your own networks and I think it's very, very important that uh, talent is attended in many organizations I've seen that the chief of HR is not at the same level as other CXOs. It is at one or two levels lower. Bar. To me, the first hire when Marico began was head of HR, the first hire, because I think that played a very important role in creating the right 
talent culture, attracting talent, retaining talent. So it's, I think one has to take it very, very seriously and go on ensuring that the image plays a role uh, in terms of employee value proportion, governance also, and these days the governance has become expanded to ESG because if you are going to a management school, all students are going to ask, what is, what is the organization doing? What is the purpose of the organization? So this has to be taken very, very seriously. And then in our case, well, how we created uh, attraction was basically to say that we are, we are a professionally managed organization. I was the only family member in Marico managing it. Uh, everything will work on merits. Influence will not work. If I have somebody who wants a job, then the decision is the line decision. At the most, I will ask that person to be evaluated. But no interference from, we are very high on governance. And more importantly, we have a culture which is very open where people will, can and they will wear, they will wear more of organizational hat. For example, they will be put into a task force to look at organization. There will be a shadow board. So individuals, capable individuals are given roles beyond what they do. And they are put in roles which are to wear a corporate hat. And then combine that with high degree of job rotation. I think we, we strongly believe that if you join us, then we create the environment for individuals to learn, to become far more uh, tuned to looking at issues from an organizational angle, uh, and also do, do job rotation. And whenever I have met individuals, not that we are able to retain all people all the time, they leave, but it's okay. Uh, but whenever I met some individual who's worked with us, uh, invariably most of the time they said that the stint we've had with Marico has been the most the best tint in terms of, and that has made us what we are today. And so, um, what about Ascent Foundation? So, Rennie here belongs to the Ascent. Uh, so, what was the motivation behind starting Ascent for young entrepreneurs? And what do you see the Indian uh, startup system as? So, Ascent started, I think, uh, 10 years now? I think so. Uh, and, uh, I wanted to do something to give back something to society. And I am not the kind of person who believes in giving monetarily. You know, for example, you give a donation to a hospital or to a school. To me, that's not giving. I am I'm more into active giving. So whatever I give, uh, financially, more than financially, I have to be engaged. And I have to spend 10, 20, 30 percent of my time in doing that. So that was the thought process and I had to look at various passions, because if I had to give my time, then I should be passionate about that subject. So I identified entrepreneurship as one way to give innovation, which I'm doing the Innovation Foundation and Health. So these are the three passions that I identified, preventive health, innovation, and, and entrepreneurship, which are, I can add value by giving my time. And uh, I strongly believe that entrepreneurs create a lot of wealth. If India has to grow, we can't, go on depending on the government to drive economic growth. Ultimately, it has to be driven by entrepreneurs. So if I can help entrepreneurs learn from each other, if I can help them scale, then I would be doing my part in terms of driving the economic growth, which will again be good for all the stakeholders. You know. So that was a thought process behind starting Ascent. Yeah, over a period of time, it has grown. I think today we have about 850 entrepreneurs with Ascent. And I think cumulatively they do a turnover about 30,000 crores. But the feedback is very good. We do NPS scores and we get a score of, I don't know, 70, 75 NPS score. Um, there is a certain time commitment required and we make it very clear before an entrepreneur joins. But financially, earlier we, there was no charge. And people or some entrepreneurs were taking it lightly. Now we charge 10,000 rupees a year. But that again entitles them to, to be a part of many of the events we do. Uh, we have lots of events, hurdles, learning events, conclave. So this is just to get their commitment and nothing else. Uh, but it is funded by me, all the other costs. Um, maybe Rani can speak a little bit more about Ascent being, being a member. 
Hello, everyone. Good morning, Harsh and ma'am. So I've been lucky uh, to be part of Ascent Foundation, uh, started by Mr. Harsh. I think there are two things which changed my life. One was first FMB, because I got to meet a lot of talent here. And then was Ascent. So Ascent came in a time when I was actually growing. And since three years, I think I've changed as an entrepreneur and now as a human being also. So I think everybody who really wants to transform um, from an individual to a growing entrepreneur should be a part of Ascent. Thank you so much. Great. So, okay. sir, on that note, I think uh, I'm going to just ask you. So a just to add a little bit, if okay. anybody wants to join Ascent. You can go to our website, <laughs> www.sfoundation.in. We want more members, actually. You know, I, my target is to have 10,000 entrepreneurs. Lovely. So, we are at 850, but I think now we have earlier in Bombay, then we went to Chennai, now it's all India. So, any of you, any of your friends, you have to be a certain size and you have to be committed to giving some time, but all I can assure you is that you will benefit a lot. Yeah, sure, sure. Sir. So, a quick uh, rapid fire round now. Uh, just to know, uh, Mr. Mariwala, up close, your favorite song, <laughs> sir? <laughs> yeah, I'm more interested in actually Indian classical music. Okay. <laughs> so there is no song because it's a long. So, but I am interested more in Indian classical vocal. That's my passion. You know. Okay. But I listen to Hindi music now. You want me to give some? <laughs> uh, <laughs> At least one song. One song. So I I like the song. Ab ab jaane ki jid mana karo. Achha. I can't ab sing it, but. Ab jaane ki jid na karo. <laughs> Achha. Okay. Wow. Very nice. Your favorite political leader other than Mahatma Gandhi, sir? <laughs> I would name two amongst the prime ministers in India. Uh, I'm, when I said political, I just looked at the prime minister. I would say that one of the most underrated prime ministers is Narasimha Rao. You know, he's the one who, who drove the overall reform process. Yes. Of course, Manmohan Singh executed, but it was him who, who made it happen. He's not been recognized for that. That's true. And second, being a true diplomat is uh, Artul Bihari Bajpayee. He's the true. All right. Great. The food that you crave for most? <laughs> I am a vegetarian, okay. but uh, I like trying different cuisines. So whenever I'm traveling to any other country, I like to try the local cuisine. If I'm traveling to a state, I make it a point to have that cuisine. But among the favorite ones would be Japanese, Mexican. I like Maharashtrian food also a lot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Vada Pav is your favorite, sir? Sorry? Is Vada Pav your favorite? <laughs> Vada Pav, then Maharashtra, then Pitala, Thali, all that. Okay, all, yeah. all right. A principle that you live by, sir? I think I strongly believe in transparency and trust. Yeah, I think that we got. And meritocracy also. Meritocracy, okay. An employee you remember and why do you remember him? So, two of my key people who helped me many years back, they lost them. So, partly because they are no more, they both of them died in an accident. Individually they died, not jointly. But uh, I mean, that was a bit of a shock because uh, at, at a young age they died and you know, and okay. they played a very important role in my journey. In your journey. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. A value that guides you? I think to some extent it's the repeat of principle the you principle. live by. So, yeah. yeah. So, all right. And your favorite brand, Parachute or Sephora? You are asking me a question as if who are, is my daughter my favorite or son my favorite, you know. <laughs> it's very difficult to answer that question. <laughs> I think on that note, any questions, we'll have a couple of questions because Mr. Mariwala has to leave. But a couple of quick questions, maybe from, okay, Reni. <laughs> Just a quick one, Reni. And maybe one from the new batch. So this is just in continuation to the morning yeah, discussion yeah. which we had. In family business, uh, the often the biggest challenge is the division of stake. You know, uh, at times there's a confusion. Is it based on talent and contribution or just by genetics? And I think I've learned from my experience that if it's not defined well in time, it can cause a trouble in personal as well as professional growth. So what's your input on that? No, I think it's a very valid, valid question. I think there's a lot of confusion within the families in terms of how the stake should be. Uh, in my case, I can give you my example, why I joined the organization. At that time, my father and three other brothers, each of them had 25% stake. And we had three, four different businesses. I attended to the edible oil business and converted into an FMCG company. 
I could have said that because I built this business, I should get a higher stake. But I didn't do that, you know, because I strongly believe that if you have inheriting a business, then it's equal stake, you know. So I didn't get anything extra because I built that business. And this was this almost formed almost 90% of our group assets at that time. But my share in that also only was 25%, my father being 25, I'm the only son. So, but I don't regret about it, you know, because uh, just because I built it doesn't entitle me to a higher stake. Now, if you are starting a business, then you may say, okay, I am starting a business. You may have an arrangement with the family because I am starting the business. Am I entitled to? But these are very tricky subjects within the family. You know, it can cause a lot of discontent. And I didn't want that to happen. Now, I can give you one more example I know. Uh, and that was driven by the father. So, I am talking of the JSW uh, group. Mm -hmm. Each son was given one one and the shareholding was the four brothers and father was. So, what the father did was, suppose if I was having Mariko and I, my father had four siblings. I would have 20 percent shareholding, but the father gave, because I was managing something, he gave his 20 percent to the person who was managing. So, that person got 40 percent, but that was driven by father. It's an innovative way, but I don't think again there is a right answer. A lot depends on the family, the maturity within the family, but the moment you ask for anything which is differentiated, it's, it's a hotbed of conflicts. You know. Just one more question. Yes, please. Just introduce yourself and… Hello, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, my question to you is that uh, in today's time, uh, smaller businesses so that I've, I've noticed is that there are bigger companies which are diving into all kinds of ventures. So, Tata's are opening up uh, businesses in different, different sectors. So, how do you think smaller businesses today, how difficult is it to bring, build a brand today? Like you built Medico in the 90s. So, how do you think, sir, with this kind of competition coming in from the bigger brands where they're entering every sector, how does a smaller business some of us are in manufacturing, some of us do distribution for different brands. How do we independently build a brand in today's time? It's a difficult question to answer, first of all, but all I can say is yes, you will have competition. You will have, the environment is changing so fast that each and every business is getting threatened by technology. Even I thought FMCG is relatively defensive business, but look at all the D2C brands which have happened. Look at uh, the likes of Udan and and geo which are disrupting in the distributor marketplace. So, you have to look at two issues. One is the disruptions and how you are able to gear to take on the disruptions. And one is competitive threats. Another disruption itself, you may never have thought of a competition which is a disruptor because it, some technology is disrupting, you know, and all of a sudden they got disrupted. It is not there on your the horizon. Yes. Like five or ten years back, would, would a company like Mama Earth or Nike or I would not even have thought them, but today they are all competitors. So, you need to be very clear what is your right to win, you know, and you will have, depending on the segment, depending on the potential, you will have different type of competitors, but the key thing is, as I mentioned earlier, you have to identify what will make you win in the marketplace. And I think the differentiator is very important. If you are in a technology business, it's cutting edge technology. If you are in a pharma business, some from IP, if you are in some other business, it could be innovation. If you are in service business, can you have some other, for example, dominoes or whatever, you know, talking of shorter delivery period. So, you need to identify what is the key differentiator you are creating and can you be better and better in that differentiator to fight the competition on one side and then also look at how the business is going to get disrupted. Uh, we see seen many businesses just getting destroyed because of disruption. So, how will disruptions impact? You just need to, you know, project it over a period of time and, you know, take steps accordingly. Thank you, sir. I think what, what sir is saying is that you have to be aware. You can't be complacent, right? You need to be on top of what's happening around you. And I think to that extent, macro, you know, macros are very important. Macroeconomics. So, who could have imagined the impact of Ukraine, Russia, you know, but it has a huge impact. So, geopolitics, macros, trends internationally, <laughs> natural, vegan, ESG, these are all trends, technology, uh, digital movement, 
you can't just say, no, no, I am doing that business, but you have to, as a CEO, you have to look at what macros are happening, what are the trends happening internationally. Because it's a matter of time that trend which has happened in some country, a vegan trend, it has to come to India. These are all global trends. It's a matter of time. All right. On that note, I, I think we will stop this part of the 25-year celebrations. Uh, we will proceed outside for a cake cutting. Yeah. So may I request all of you to come outside. We'll have a brief cake cutting ceremony. And then we come back. Professor Murthy will be then taking a set a class on reflections. <laughs>